Homework three is circuits. We're going to finally start talking about very practical applications. If this course was really abstract and you wondered what the heck does this have to do with anything, we're going to now put this all stuff, all the practical use, talk about toasters and space heaters and light bulbs and all this stuff. Um, and believe it or not, what we've been talking about is the basis for this. Well, let's do it. So here's what I'm going to do. So this is the start of uh, homework number three material, and it's going to be the beginning of circuits. Although circuits is something we'll continue forward with for several homeworks. Okay. Um, I think it's homework uh, four as well, possibly beyond. I don't remember. Okay. So here's what we're going to do to set up our initial situation. We're going to have one conductor. This is a conductor. And I guess I'll call that conductor number one. And then I'll have a second independent conductor, conductor number two. So these are just some kind of hunks of metal, okay? So some two independent things just sitting on the space. And here's what we have. They're not both neutral, because that wouldn't be that exciting. What we're going to do is we're going to um, create some kind of charge of balance on the two, right? So we're going to um, somehow make it so that the protons and electrons on the two are not in equal ratio. So let's say, for instance, um, we remove some electrons off of this, so we get some electrons off of that, and that'll leave an overall positive charge. Now, because charge is mobile on a conductor, the excess charge resides on the outside because, of course, that's how it can maximally repel. Now, you might say, well, protons aren't really mobile. Well, of course, the electrons kind of, the electrons are the things that can move around, and they'll move around in such a way as to leave the excess charge on the outside, okay? And I'm going to do the same thing with the other conductor as well, okay? So I'm going to remove some electrons off of that, but um, not as many. Okay, so I guess the way I could represent that, I'll draw uh, a larger quantity of negative charges taken off the uh, top one. This one not as much, so I can draw it, kind of just draw it as plus plus. I'll draw some excess charge on the outside, but not as much. So I drew only three. Okay. So what we have now is that if we connected these two, you can probably imagine that these two, the, if this has more plus charge, more excess charge, and this has less, then when you, if you actually let them talk to each other, they would spread out with some of this charge going on to this, right? Does that make sense? So if the, the char like charge wants to repel as much as possible, why would all this excess charge stay here if it had the opportunity, if I touch this, to spread out on this, right? That, in essence, is what electric circuits do, is they set up an incentive where there's more charge over here uh, than over here, and you let that charge transfer from one to the other, but you make it burn its keep. So it doesn't just get to come over for free, it has to do something for you. It has to pay some kind of toll, some kind of useful function for you, okay? So how do we, first let's talk about how to quantify this. I'm gonna go right back over to my formula that I just developed. This E, of course, is E net. Let me ask you this. Um, do you remember what the net electric field was inside a conductor? Zero. So inside a conductor, it's zero, this idea of perfect shielding. The average electron inside has no desire to do anything else because if whatever you try to do to the outside 
from the outside it would be shielded by some charge polarization. Well, what does that mean? It means that the delta V is zero, which means the voltage is constant on the entire conductor. So on any one part of the conductor, you would see the same voltage as any other part of that same conductor. In fact, you can think of a conductor, it's entirely an equipotential. I like to think of a conductor as a plateau, okay? So we talked about hills and valleys, right? And hills and valleys, charges want to either get off of them or get, get it, go into them or whatever. But imagine you had something like this, a voltage plateau, okay? If you put a charge on here, let's say a positive charge, right? Positive charges like to get to lower voltage. But here, there is no lo lower voltage to get to, right? So it just stays there, right? It has nowhere to go. And of course, if you looked at your average Joe Schmo electron in here, it's perfectly mobile, but it's not going to do anything because it doesn't have any desire to do it. It's completely protected from any external influences, okay? So this, the voltage change is zero, the voltage is constant. Therefore, if you look at the equation, electric field is zero. That, by the way, brings up an interesting point about high voltage power lines, okay? You know about high voltage power lines, right? You don't want to touch them, but you can also see birds landing on them and they're fine, right? Why is that? Well, birds land on them with their feet together, okay? And if their feet together, then this foot is at high voltage and this foot is at high voltage. So what's the voltage difference? Nothing. Why would a charge want to go from 10,000 volts to another spot that's also 10,000 volts? There's no reason to do that, right? There's no energetic advantage from going from one voltage to the exact same voltage. Why would it go all the way through the bird and go, oh, I don't have any lower potential energy than I did when I left. So the danger in high voltage is because when you touch it, it's a high voltage on your hand and lower voltage on your feet, and that's what causes it. So you, there's no, it's not high voltage to fear, it's a high voltage difference. Okay? That is the issue. Okay? That's the danger. So. Um, that is the reason, by the way, why many people automatically assume a strong electric field is tied to a high voltage value. But we just showed that electric field is tied to how rapidly the voltage changes, right? So that's what you're concerned with. When you touch something that's at high voltage, the danger is that you're presenting a path from high voltage to low voltage, okay? Voltage by itself does not make any difference. If it were 10,000 volts on this side of the plateau and 10,000 volts on this side of the plateau, maybe that's one foot of the bird and the other foot of the bird, there's no reason to do go from one place to the other, right? Charges need energetic motivation, okay? And we talked uh, a couple lectures ago about the fact that you can automatically scale the voltage value really however you want. It's only differences that matter, right? So it doesn't matter there's no difference between a million in volts and a million volts. There's no difference, just like zero volts and zero volts, no difference. Okay? Differences are the only things that end up mattering. So what we have here is we have one plateau where the voltage value is the same everywhere on this. Okay? No difference in voltage value from one place to any other place. And also over here. However, even though they're both plateaus, they're not going to be plateaus at the same level. So what we just created is one plateau at one voltage and one plateau at another voltage. And so we can create some charge of motivation to do something if we connect these two plateaus, right? It's kind of like if you had one plateau here and one plateau over here, a charge is not going to be interested in going off either plateau. But if you put it on the transition, if you allow there to be a pathway, to go from one plateau to another, now we're in business, okay? So that's what we're going to do. This one, by the way, 
it's more positively charged, so this is going to be a higher voltage, that's a higher plateau. This one, not quite as much, so it's going to be a relatively lower voltage in comparison. Now you might say, aren't they both positively charged and both make voltage values that are positive? Yes, but again, we're interested ever increasingly into differences. So what I, when I say this is a, a higher voltage, it's plus, you can call it plus if you wanted. You can call this plus if you wanted, but this is more plus, right? This is a higher value than this is. If you want, you can call this plus and this plus plus or something, okay? It doesn't really matter. You're trying to create a difference. That's what, where the action is. All right? So, let's go ahead and put in a, a charge in free space. Let's say it's an electron, right? An electron, that I put it right there. It's going to want to go to the higher voltage. We know that electrons like to go to higher voltage. Right? Or, if you want, you can imagine this hypothetical positive charge, like a proton, it would want to go to lower voltage, right? So we have that both of these would lower their potential energy, and where does it go when you lower your energy in storage? It goes into kinetic energy, into kinetic energy. That's because we're just letting it move through free space, so we're letting it go what we want, where it wants to, and we're letting it keep all its energy in itself, so it's just going faster because it's going into low potential energy. But let me suggest another way. Instead of just letting this happen in free space, so this is free space, free space, that's homework number two, it's all free space, now let's make it earn its keep. Let's do something for us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect these two with a bridge. So what should this bridge be made out of? Let's definitely not make it a conductor. Because if you connect two conductors with another conductor, you have what? A big conductor, right? And if you have a big conductor, a conductor, any contiguous piece of conductor is in equipotential. So what would happen is the charges would immediately rearrange, and then no one would have any motivation to do anything anymore. So we have to not have it be a conductor. We want to have it be an insulator. An insulator is something where we talked about is that the electrons are going to be bound, and so it's not going to be easy to get through this gauntlet, right? So if you imagine what happens inside a conductor, let me uh, draw this, uh, this kind of um, contraption here. So this is my bridge. Let me draw a little bit of a, uh, a bigger view of it. Here's what we have. We have positively charged nuclei, and I'm going to draw those with a dotted line, because of course that's what we find on the inside of the atoms, right? But what do we find on the outside? Of course, these have electrons around them. Electrons. So we find that there are electrons on the outside. That's basically what's going on in the atomic level, right? So let's imagine now that we have one of these electrons. Now, remember in conductor number two, this is a conductor, so it has free electrons. And they would say, hey, I'd like to get to a higher voltage. Let me, let me, now I see, smell that there's a way to do that. There's a path, path to higher voltage. But imagine having to burrow through all this crap. You have to dodge other negative charges, right? And you are constantly going to kind of be bobbing and weaving around those. And of course, what's going to happen, for every force, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So as this gets kind of jostled around on its journey to higher voltage, that's what it wants to get to, it's going to jostle these guys around, right? It's going to take some of the energy it has and impart it into the negative charges. So after that negative electron from one conductor has burrowed through, you're going to find that the uh, atoms inside are jiggling, right? Now, um, 
what, is it, what does it mean when you take uh, some atoms inside a material and they jiggle faster? What does that mean? It heats up. So here's what we have. We find that even though this charge goes to lower potential energy, we actually find that it doesn't really go any faster when it gets to the other end than it did before. So it's not able to keep the potential energy that it lost is kinetic energy. It's actually lost that energy to heat in this material. It doesn't just speed up because it has nothing in its way. And in fact, it gets rid of all of that energy. It's actually not going really any faster at the end at the bridge than it did at the beginning. So what we are able to do here is harness a potential difference, a voltage difference, into heat. So what can you make out of this? You can make a space heater, right? You can just literally turn into heat. You can make that thing something so hot that it glows. A light bulb. There, those old incandescent light bulbs, they make light. They're also really, really hot, which is really just the byproduct of, the light is just really a byproduct of the heat. Or you could do it on a timer and you can make a toaster, right? So these are all things where you're just getting out of electrical potential energy, you're getting heat, okay? So what we'll do is we'll do the details of this heat, how much heat do you get, what do you use it for, we'll do that next time.